Hello my friends. Welcome to my channel, Lindy's Magpie Reads. This is a place where I talk about books. I finished three books since my last video and I've also bailed on two. Now I don't usually talk about bails on this channel but I have a reason and that is because I also want to talk about genre categorization. Now recently Sarah on her channel uh, Roadworthy talked about um, genre categories and readerly ex expectations and um, you know how publishers decide what to call a book whether horror or science fiction or whatever. I'm going to link that uh, video down below if you haven't watched it or if you're not subscribed to her channel she's fantastic if you like my channel i'm sure you will like hers as well the whole idea of genre categorization is to help readers find the kind of books they want to read so you know it's not like i blame publishers for tagging books you know whatever categories they think might fit but books don't always fit so neatly into categories there are a lot of books that straddle uh, two or more different categories and i'm going to be talking about some of those uh, later on in this video uh, libraries also use genre categorization and sometimes have to be really strict or have really um, firm guidelines. So for example, uh, in the library where I worked in Edmonton, the Edmonton Public Library, for something to be considered a mystery, there had to be a dead body in the first chapter. Uh, historical fiction in a library, that is a contentious category. I'm going to talk more about that later on in this video. Uh, but even something that you'd think is really straightforward like is it fiction or is it non-fiction and that uh, also comes up in this video first i want to talk about a book that i read years ago the frozen thames by uh, helen humphreys uh, canadian author originally born in the uk and this is a collection of vignettes covering the many times over the years that the Thames froze solid. People were able to walk on it. It's a, a gorgeous um, presentation with French flaps and lots of illustrations, paintings. Um, it's just a gorgeous um, item to hold. But what struck me about this is it was classified as nonfiction by the publisher and I had the opportunity to ask the author why this was considered nonfiction because each one of those vignettes uh, seems like a little fictional story and she said Lindy it is fiction. The reason the publisher put it in nonfiction is because the nonfiction editor wanted to work with Helen Humphreys. So that's why they put it in nonfiction. So, you know, sometimes it's as arbitrary as that. Now, this book by Kinesia Lubrin that I bailed on, Code Noir, I was 40% in and I decided it's just not for me or not for me right now and there is an element of fact in it because the code noir refers to um, a whole bunch of historical edicts that the King Louis XIV in France made about slavery in the French colonies. These edicts were passed um, in about 1685, something like that. 
and there is artwork throughout this novel. This is Kinesia Lubrin's first novel uh, that I really love. So it was the art that I liked even better than the vignette kind of stories. The art is by Tokawasi Dyson and what she has done is take these edicts and, like I said, make a piece of art with them. The edicts say things like, Article 33, the slave who will have struck his master, his mistress, or the husband of his mistress, or their children, with contusion or bloodshed or in the face, will be punished with death. So just an example. Lubrin is a poet. I bailed on her collection Voodoo Hypothesis a while back and she's received so much critical acclaim and awards. Her poetry collection The Disgraphist won the Griffin Poetry Award, very prestigious award. But I feel like I just don't have the key to unlock her writing. So I am going to keep trying her, uh, but I'm setting this aside for now. For those of you who might find that this is exactly the right book for you, I want to tell you a little bit more. The Vignettes are written in a whole bunch of different literary styles. They are all about characters who are either experiencing slavery or the after effects of uh, slavery. And, and it all it seems to be coming from a place of grief. Maybe I'll read a little sample. This is called Clock Towers. The wheel is inside it, and I push the wheel. In the dark green eve, the wheel rolls slowly along thick twine that hangs on the two diagonal joists. The wheel comes to rest on a notebook held up on a banister and covered with a round piece of black linen. The notebook is said to have belonged to the invisible girl who lived in the attic before my great-grandparents, who were put here by a previous owner of this big, farmhouse, the illegitimate son of an invisible man. Time here is a theory kept separate from everything visible beyond the plantations. Next to the banister, the window lies open and I can hear the birds, a black-faced grass quit, maybe two corn birds, a tinamau making its solos, several pigeons and ground doves, I envy their thousands of days spent together as I clean the incessant dust off the cloth notebook, the banister, even though I do not live dirtily. I have no other companion with whom to soil the days. I've spent excessive hours wondering at the leisurely dust, how it gathers on the notebook. The few pieces of furniture I live with, it is also their duty, I suppose, to catch the dirt of our lives. Such unbidden accumulation defies every tool the hand can wield against dust. But here I am at the carnival of orange hues budding on every surface, and I must wash myself with a new schedule for keeping the notebook above all clean. There's nothing unnatural about the dust, but the notebook I have kept clean for 10 decades, it is the only thing here I can touch with feathers, never with flesh. So I keep it covered with this piece of black linen, the black that shows everything, no matter how invisible, always. In three hours, I will dissolve and the invisible girl will return. And so it goes. In 100 years, I will return, chronicling every free second, binding the volumes of our lives from the dust. And that was the entirety of one of these vignettes in Code Noir. Uh, 
And the next book I'm going to tell you about is also a bale. I have mentioned it before on this channel, Alphabetical Diaries by Sheila Hetty. I love this author, uh, but this book, uh, I feel like it's not the right time yet. If you don't know, it's composed in a unique way. Uh, Hetty took 10 years worth of diary entries, sorted them into entirely alphabetical order, the sentences, and then eliminated a whole bunch of sentences until the sentences that are left make a novel. So the question is, is it actually a novel? Uh, in some ways it seems more like poetry to me. In the same way that Canicia Lubrin's uh, debut novel also seems a lot like poetry. Uh, Jess over at the channel Stalking Kafka talked about this question uh, specifically about alphabetical diaries in a recent video which I will link in the description box below. I think that she had it on her possible list for a book to be on the Women's Prize for Fiction long list and then someone said but no it's non-fiction well, even the publishers don't agree on this. So uh, Sheila Hetty's Canadian, and I went to the Canadian publisher's website, NOPF Canada. They have listed it under the categories literary fiction, women's fiction, historical fiction, and just plain fiction. However, if you go to the American Publishers website, so that is Macmillan, there it's listed under the category bios and memoirs. It did come, the words came from her actual journal, so uh, maybe that's not surprising. And then in the UK, it's published by Fitzcarraldo, and it, they've given it a white cover. And as far as I know, uh, at Fitzcarraldo Editions, with the blue cover, those are fiction, and with a white cover, it's nonfiction. Um, if I'm wrong about that, please correct me in the comments. So, where does that leave us as a reader? Well, <laughs> just do you like it or not, I guess. And I tried it first in the print format and I found it intriguing. I liked the rhythm of it, but I didn't feel like I'd, I could read the whole book of it. I just wasn't in the right mood. And because it's a new book, there's a waiting list at the library and you know, back it had to go. But I also had the opportunity to listen to the audiobook. And I listened to chapter, uh, chapter one is all the sentences that start with A, chapter two is all the sentences that start with B, and I found it kind of somnorific. I thought, yeah, this would be a, a good book to put me to sleep. I have a lot of insomnia, and uh, that's not going to do justice to Sheila Hetty's writing, really. So if you're curious about what it sounds like in audio, the reader is Kate Berlant, who is an American comedian, and you can listen to a sample on the Macmillan website. So um, yeah, look for that link down below. I'll try and remember to put that in there. But instead of treating a work of literature that way, I decided to switch to uh, the Helen Zaltzman's podcast, The Tranquillusionist. That's uh, kind of like a, a subcategory of her podcast, The Illusionist. In The Tranquillusionist, she is deliberately creating a soundtrack to fall asleep to. So. If you're interested in The Tranquillusionist, look for a link down below. So both of those books that I've bailed on, I am not 
closing the door to those. I can see myself going back to them when I'm in the right mood. Now I'm going to go on to the books that I did finish, starting with the audiobook Wayward by Amelia Hart. She is a um, Australian writer who now lives in the UK and I listened to Wayward in audiobook and for me that worked really well because there are three different timelines, three different women who are all connected in a family line. Alpha in Cumbria in 1619 and she is being tried as a witch. Then there's Violet in 1942, also in Cumbria, and Kate in 2019 ends up in Cumbria. I have been doing a project where I have been uh, reading books that other booktubers had on their best of 2023 lists. And this is one that I chose from Scott of Gunpowder Fiction and Plots, 23 best books of 2023. I did not like it as well as Scott did, but it did work for me. Like I, I would call it a soft, uh, soft pick, three stars. I liked the feminism. I liked the sense of history, the sense of place, uh, the way that the three women central characters uh, developed into stronger women. So that feminism aspect, yes, I really liked that. But I found the, what, what detracted for me is that the male characters are almost all um, pretty one-dimensional vile. I, I like more nuance than that. And also the, the magical element there's a slight fantastical element of witchcraft, real witchcraft magic. The connection with um, nature and um, women having that magical connection. Mm. It just didn't, it didn't quite work for me. But this is one of those books that would be hard to categorize. Uh, yes. Scott himself, in, in the video where he talked about it, which I will link down below, by the way, uh, he described it as being on the literary side of commercial fiction and the commercial side of literary fiction. So somewhere in the middle there, uh, it's partly historical because two of the timelines are set back in time um, but the third timeline is contemporary and it's also got this fantastical element so do you call it fantasy uh, do you call it historical fiction what in a library i think this would just go under general fiction <laughs> And one more thing I'd like to mention about Wayward is that it won two awards in the Goodreads, you know, at the end of the year when they have thousands and thousands of Goodreads user vote on best book. And it won in the debut category and also in the historical fiction category. Many people have loved this book. If you've read it, let me know what you think in the comments down below, okay? Now the other audiobook that I read is another one that has multiple genres. I'm talking about Loot by Tanya James. This was long listed for the National Book Award and it is currently on the long list for the Carol Shields Prize. I have read a previous book by Tanya James, The Tusk That Did the Damage, and I will link that, uh, a review that I did of that book down below. That was back in 
2015 when I used to write a lot more book reviews on my book blog. So in the public library, this book would definitely be considered historical fiction because it has uh, real historical figures in it, well at least one, the Tipu Sultan from Mysore, and, uh, and also a, an artifact, an automaton of uh, a tiger eating a man that was in the Tipu Sultan's collection. So what Tanya James has done is she's imagined who created this automaton. And so there are two characters that work together, um, a Muslim Indian uh, Abbas, who was 17 years old at the time when he worked on it, and a Frenchman, Lucien Dulys. And we're mostly following the life of Abbas. Uh, it becomes a, a, a building's roman, a coming of age story. It's also a high seas adventure. It's uh, got true uh, romance novel elements and it's a heist novel too. So there is so much going on and I really loved the, the vivid setting. It starts in 1794 uh, for the one part of the action and then the rest of the action moves to Rouen, France and uh, the countryside of England in 1805. What really gives a lot of heft to this story is that the, the underlying uh, themes are serious ones, colonialism, imperialism, racism. Uh, it's a story of self-reinvention, and yet it's told with a lot of um, wit, and it's almost farcical. Uh, there's this uh, picaresque element to it, and I just found it entirely engaging and entertaining. Uh, I've read five books now on the Carol Shields Prize long list, and I wouldn't be sad if this one wins, uh, but I also really like Burnham Wood, so there's a chance for that one as well. And while I'm talking about Burnham Wood, it's by Eleanor Catton, and her novel, The Luminaries, that one I remember at Edmonton Public Library, it had originally been uh, categorized in the historical fiction section, and it got pulled out because uh, even though it's set in the mid-1800s on the west side of the South Island of New Zealand during the gold rush, there wasn't any particular historical figure to tie it to, or that was the reason I was given anyway. Um, it seemed bizarre to me that this one was not considered historical fiction, but it's a tough job <laughs> trying to pin down books and say, this is this, this is historical fiction, this is mystery. There's definitely a mystery element in the, the luminaries, by the way. Anyway, as readers, we can just enjoy, right? I have got one more book to tell you about. So this is my favorite of the bunch. It's called Portrait of a Body, and it's by Julie Delport. It's translated from French by Helga Dasher and Karen Houle. It's a graphic memoir about how Julie Delport realized that late in life, so at mid-30s, she realized that she is a lesbian. And it includes so many references to lesbian films and uh, lesbian writers, 
or feminist writers. So for example, Annie Ernaux and Monique Wittig and Tova Janssen and uh, Judith Butler. Uh, in this page, you can see her reading a collection of essays by Dorothy Allison called Skin. She uses both colored pencils, like you can see in this image, and uh, watercolor. In the pages with colored pencil, there's often little marks uh, where she's kind of like testing the colors. It just adds something so personal um, that the, you see how the artist is creating her work. Now, some, a lot of these images, it's hard to figure out how they tie in uh, to what the, um, what the text is. It's hard to sometimes figure out what, what's what. For example, she has uh, pictures of sliced agate. And there, there are notes at the back where she says what her subject was that she was drawing. There's some starfish. The lettering is all handwritten, in cursive. And I really want to give you a sense of her voice here. The opening passage, what didn't kill me didn't make me stronger. Time hasn't healed all my wounds, and yet here I am, still very much alive. The first time I had sex with a woman, all I had to go by were images and films made by men. To overwrite those images, I watched the final scene of Chantal Ackerman's Je, Tu, Il, Elle a few times in a row. I was proud of my new orientation, but dying of embarrassment that it had arrived so late. I was worried about being the straight girl who experiments and then runs back to the boys. The lesbians around me didn't seem to love that behavior. This is just so gorgeous. It's um, not a, a typical memoir at all because you don't actually learn very much about Julie, uh, but that specific experiences with sex with men when she was younger and then with women as she's coming into her sexuality as a lesbian I just so interesting I really love this and not only that but the book itself is a gorgeous object um, the paper on the cover is uh, sort of silky except where the drawing is and it's got um, a, more of a matte feel to it. Yeah. Ooh. It's the kind of book that's easy to flip through and just read sections and think about them. Uh, so great. I just really, really loved it. Uh, Julie Delport is, uh, she was born in France, now lives in Quebec, and I have read one other book by her, Antennas Everywhere, and that one is about a girl with debilitating sensitivity to electromagnetic radiation. But there is a similar quality of lots of white space, lots of things to wonder about. She doesn't hand everything to you on a platter, this author, no. But that is all I've got for you today. So thank you so very much for watching. Uh, please, if you have comments on the subject of genre classification, I would love to hear your input on this topic. And I am going to leave you with 
a few images from the trees that are blooming in Victoria. We have had gorgeous blue sky and the cherry blossoms are out. The magnolias are open. It almost feels like summertime. Enjoy. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you all soon, so bye for now.